Thank you, choir. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Judges. Verse, uh, chapter 6 and 7, we have several verses uh, that will be a part of our message today. And uh, I would like to just quote for you Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. And it goes like this, Nay, in all these things... We are more than conquerors to him that loved us, or through him that loved us. Now you might underscore that word, more than conquerors. How can you be more than a conqueror when you've been so uh, abused and maligned and persecuted, as Paul talks about in the verses that precedes that verse? Well, it's because of the one we love and serve. He is able to make all grace abound toward us. As I said a moment ago, I don't believe any human being of just average intelligence has any desire to be a total colossal failure in life. I believe that every human being has within his emotions a desire to be better than what he is or what she is. And there isn't anything wrong with that. I don't know of a preacher that would, if he's got any sense, or what would like to be a better preacher than what he is. And I think that's true in most all of the professions. You can find men who are involved in advanced science and technology, and they're all the time working in the laboratory and in the library and they're applying themselves to know more and to be able to accomplish more. Well, then wouldn't it stand to reason if people do that in the field of science and technology that we ought to do it as Christians, that we ought to have aspiration and desire and hope and push and energy and sacrifice uh, to excel and be better than really what we are in our common, ordinary days that we live. Now, this is the city of the champions, the Cincinnati Reds. We have just taken the World Series. And these young men were screaming and hollowing and jumping up on each other and, and beating on each other and uh, reveling in the fact that they had defeated the Oakland Athletics and were world champions against the odds of the so-called experts. And I never could understand that, how that our Reds won from opening day and led their league all the way through their division until the last day and through the last day of the season. But that shows you also the negative thinking that sometimes accompanies what I'm really trying to get over to you and talking to you about today. You're going to have forces at work uh, to cripple your thinking, to cripple your faith, to destroy uh, that uh, energy you have through the study of the Word of God to excel in the Lord's work. You know, Matthew tells us that when the Word is so uh, sown, that an enemy comes and takes that word out of the hearts of people. Did you know he says that? Now, if you let him take the word out of your heart and out of your mind and out of your emotions, then you're void of any strength that can come through the study and the application of the word of God. Uh, study to show thyself approved unto God, the book tells us. Desire, uh, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And for those of us that have tried to spend a lifetime in this book and to use it and to make it uh, effective in our lives, we know what this is all about because we have seen what the word will do. Now, in the sixth chapter of Judges, there was a man by the name of Gideon and he's working in the threshing business by the wine press. And they were hiding, he was hiding from the Midianites. 
And in the 12th verse, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. That's Judges chapter 6 and verse 12. Now this is a strong statement. The angel of the Lord had a message for this man working out on the farm, on a wheat farm, hard by the wine press. Evidently, he, as he talks to the Lord uh, later on, his family, they were small and, and uh, not uh, too impressive. And so he's finding some excuses. But the Lord is with me, with thee, the angel said, thou mighty man of valor. Honesty, integrity, accomplishments. Now, you need to understand that, beloved people. Here God is, through his angel, servant, or messenger, talking to a man just like you and me, and calls him a mighty man of valor. Now, it's true that he didn't call all 32,000 of these soldiers later on, uh, but you notice he singles him out, and here's a man, a member of a team that's developing that has the right attitude. And I won't talk about that. You can judge character by attitude. You can judge accomplishments in a young person by their attitude. You can, you can just mark her down, brother. Regardless of who you are or the family you come from, if you have the right attitude about life and life situations, you're going to come out a winner down the road. Now, did you hear what I said? I said you would come out a winner. You'll be a member of a winning team, but I don't care how much talent, how much ability, that you may have, and how much preparation you have had, you'll never be a winner until you conquer attitude. Now you might as well put her down. If it's on the baseball field, uh, you can have a team of superstars. They said earlier this year that the San, uh, San Diego uh, baseball team had more talent than anybody in this in that division, but they didn't win it. They had uh, mega stars on that team, and I'm quoting what the paper said. And we did not have that on our team. And the uh, and the young man is supposed to be the mega star, according to the money was making, batted 170, uh, 174 in the in the playoffs, and yet. The Cincinnati Reds are world champions. Amen. Amen. Now just stop and think about pro sports, and I'll, I'll help you to understand. And young people, let me tell you something. You can have truckloads of talent and have a bad attitude. What does that young man, Dupree, that played uh, uh, for a college team and uh, rated the top Running back in America, but I know he got hurt. But he, he hurt himself really with his attitude, in my opinion. Marcus Dupree. Now he's trying to make a comeback. Attitude. I've been around people all my life. I was born into the human family. And I learned early in life uh, what attitude really means. When I was in school, I, I don't know, I couldn't understand it. There were young men my age, some older, some younger, and they fought studying. They didn't have any desire to study. Uh, they left the impression that uh, they were too good to study. They rebelled against it. Now just stop and think about that for a moment. Uh, for youngsters... Schooling is to help a young child equip themselves for life's responsibilities down the road. Now, some have more education than others. Some are deprived of a full-bodied education. and They uh, do not have the wherewithal to uh, complete a college education. And I know of others that have gone on to school and have a string of degrees as long as this microphone line 
uh, they're educated above their intelligence. And they'll never amount to anything. But all of this is attached to attitude. How refreshing it is to be around preachers and workers, singers, musicians, deacons, trustees, Sunday school superintendents that have a good attitude. Then I'm around other people and they want things just because they want things. They don't want things for the benefit and the betterment of other people. They just want things for themselves. You're looking maybe at a grown man or woman and they're still in the nursery. Mentally, they never have been able to get out of the nursery. So uh, uh, you find that all the time. Now, I can't dwell long enough. I don't have the time to drive home this central truth. If you want to be a member of a winning team, you've got to have the right attitude. I believe you can say the Cincinnati Reds are world champions because that team of 24 players had the right attitude. Billy Thatcher, Hatcher, Billy Hatcher, he uh, is, uh, is the epitome of that. And the young man, Jose Rio, uh, that received the uh, top award, the most valuable player, broke down and cried when they gave it to him, said it should be given to the whole team. I like that attitude. That tells us why the Reds are world champions is attitude. God help us. In the home, a home can only be as happy as husband and wife adjust their attitudes together with the children to make that a holy place for God to dwell. Attitude. But yet in so many instances... With a divorce out of every two marriages just about nowadays, it's an amazing, incredible thing how the uh, self-will and selfishness, I don't care what my husband thinks or my wife thinks or I don't care what my parents think, I'm going to do my thing. I think that's about as sorry, low down, good for nothing as any human being can be. How can I make the team better? When I came to this city nearly 40 years ago, I promised the church I'd bring the best preachers and singers and missionaries and Christian workers here that I possibly could to be a blessing to this congregation that you could hear the greatest preaching in America from this pulpit and would help you to grow and develop. Listen to me now. Just about everything makes the cycle and comes back to attitude again. You can take one talented person, like the man the Lord wrote about, took that talent out and hid it, and said, you are a mean and austere man. And I didn't, I, I, I wanted to do it my way, and so I took this talent and wrapped it in a napkin and buried it, and here it is. But the man who got two and five reproduced theirs, and God commended them for it. And it wasn't the talent that was involved, it was the attitude of those people that was involved. Come on, help me out. This is what we need today, is the right attitude, if we're going to be a member of a winning team. And you'll notice in verse 26, and uh, this... This man and the people he is leading has the right uplook. Notice, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place, and take uh, the uh, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. He had been given instruction that there was a very important facet of his life that was attached to religious worship. Do you understand that? And to be a member of a winning team in this church age, you better get your priorities put together, ladies and gentlemen, and have the right uplook about things. Who is first? 
Well, my Lord Jesus is the head of this first team, this winning team. And if I can do all things through Christ that strengthen of me, I want to be associated and connected with the winning team. I, in meditating and thinking upon this and thinking about fellows that believe and teach evolution and the atheist and the agnostics and the infidels, good land. It would, you would think that the American school system would look at the atheistic, godless philosophy of communism for the last 70 years and throw out every textbook in the public library and in the classrooms and burn the damnable things and start over in this country. Have a book burning. Now that'll get my critics hot, won't it? But I'm just trying to help those poor dupes that think they just happen to be what they are. And to look at some of them, they almost convince me. Seventy years of communism and atheism, God-hating, closing churches, killing Christians, sending them to Siberia, and the whole mess has blown up. When you think somebody in America that had uh, connections with newspapers would write a series of articles and show the total frustration, the total collapse of a godless humanistic society and say, hey, we better build some altars. We better start teaching our children about God. We better get our priorities straightened out. If you want to be a member of a winning team, we better think about it. I was listening to a man talk. He's been, uh, and I read an article of a man. He works for a big publishing company, and they're putting Bibles by the thousands into Russia. And his prediction was he'd been over there six times this year and delivering Bibles, I believe it was six times, and he said that there's such a hungry that they would take their lunch money to buy a Bible or to get religious literature. And it could be that out of 70 years of godliness and God-hatred and and denying the existence of a God under uh, the religion of communism, it ought to impress the members of Congress and our president and the judges on the benches in this country if they had good sense and proclaim a day of worship, erecting altars in every educational institution in this country, and let all of the uh, all of these God haters let them go somewhere else. Amen. This country was founded upon Christian principles. Amen. Let the ACLU get out here and build a society. They've never built anything. Isn't it amazing? All right, now, in these verses here, notice in chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. Gideon's now getting ready to go over against the Amalekites and the Midianites. And notice, he brought down the people unto the water, and God had instructed him. And the Lord said to Gideon, Every one that lappeth the water with his tongue as the dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that bowed down upon his knees to drink, uh, and the number of them that lapped, putting the hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. Now notice this, but all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said, Send them home, and I'll save you. I'll save you and deliver you from the hands of the Midianites and let all the other people go every man into his place. Now, if you're going to be a member of a winning team, you've got to have the right team outlook. Do you really know for sure that you're on the winning team? Something, something impregnated these men's hearts that changed them. That gave them some kind of a rebirth. 
They left water like a dog. And you know where they were looking toward? The Midianites and the Amalekites. They were not with their heads down, being too religious, so to speak. They were looking for the enemy. They had the right outlook on things. And men and women, in this society of ours today, if we're going to be members of a winning team, we better have the right outlook on things. Do you go around whining all the time and bemoaning all the time and worrying all the time and, and burning up spiritual energies? Well, things just not like I thought they would be. Well, quit thinking what they ought to be and just go ahead and lap water like a dog and get out there and face the enemy. Amen. It doesn't have to be just like you thought it ought to be. Right. Let God do something. Amen. You know, Gideon didn't have to have 32,000. He didn't have to have 22,000. He didn't have to have 5,000. All he needed was 300. Because God is going to do something. Now, it's amazing in working with people as I do, how few folks I really find that's got really a wonderful, enthusiastic attitude toward their lookout. Can you see the rose without looking at the thorns? When you see that little sprig come up out of the earth and it's coming from a kernel of corn and you can visualize one day a stalk with a couple of ears on it that'll be food for mankind. Can you visualize that? How do you look at life? Do you uh, do you have a negative attitude that... Uh, that everything is going to collapse all around you and everything is going to deteriorate around you? Is that the way you look at life? Or do you believe that all things work together for good around you? That's what the book said. And if you're going to be a member of that winning team, you've got to have the right outlook on life and believe in the darkest most tumultuous storm that comes to your life, that God is somewhere in the shadows. And He'll make those things come out for the best. Look at the Apostle Paul. He'd been in jail, wrote most of his books from jail. And you know what he said? He said, I'm now ready to be offered in the time of my departure. I fought a good fight, kept the faith, finished my course. I said to a fellow the other day that was moaning about life, and uh, he had said something about Paul. I said, all right, I want to ask you something. Would you rather die a martyr's death or die with uh, lung cancer? The apostle Paul wasn't troubled about choosing uh, the door through which he would leave this life into the life to come. I said to a group of preachers the other day, I said, I used to pray for God to give me length of days and long life and let me preach. But I've come to the place in life where I don't pray much about myself anymore. Just pray for other people. God can take with me and do with me whatever he wants to. I'm in his hands. What difference does it make? I've lived with him and for him long enough that I can trust him. Amen. Amen. Did you hear what I said? And as your days are, so may your faith be. Job went through all of that. Job lost everything. He lost everything that a man could lose. He lost his wealth. A man materially can't lose anything else when he loses all of his wealth. And then... He lost his family. He lost seven sons and three daughters in one day. And then his wife tried to get him curse God and die. I've always believed that young man that came as the fourth one and had all of that to say. I think old lady Job had her eyes on him. That's my opinion. It makes good preaching anyway. <laughs> 
and he lost his family. What else? He lost the respect of the community. He had been the main man. And now they make fun of him and the kids mock him in the street. And his so-called friends accuse him of having hidden sin in his life. I said to a missionary from Puerto Rico the other day, he said something to me. We were talking and he criticized Job. I said, you're not going to criticize Job around me. He's been, he's through, been through enough. He doesn't need a pep squeak like you to criticize him. That's like being nibbled to death by menace. He had lost, he had lost the respect of the so-called community. He had friends criticized him. Kids mocked him. And in addition to that, his health deteriorated to where he didn't have any health. Had some kind of a putrefying sore from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. You know what? Before that episode was over, he said, I know my Redeemer liveth. And he looked at that body of decaying flesh that was his body, and he said, Though the skin worms devour this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Now, brother, that's being on a winning team. Though the skin worms devour this flesh, this body, Yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom mine eyes shall behold and not another. That's being on the winning team, brother. When you've lost everything, I mean, down on the bottom, and yet he didn't turn loose of God. He held on. And God held on to him. There was an affinity between them. And you know what? That's not all of Job's testing. God had a message for those sorry friends, so-called, and he made them offer sacrifices. And he said, I don't like the way you treated my servant Job. Five times, God said, he rubbed it in their face. I don't like what you've done to my friend, to my servant Job. I don't like what you've done to my servant Job. I mean, God just smeared them up good, said, you offer a burnt sacrifice. But that's not all of it. You know what finally happened? God said, now, Job, if you're going to get well, I'm paraphrasing it, you're going to have to pray for these sorry bums. That's the Rawlings translation. And Job said, well, I reckon I've lost everything. There's no need of being uh, selfish about it. And so he just got out and started praying for those dudes. And God healed him. Amen. I mean, that is right smack on the bottom, brother. Now, he didn't fuss at God. He had already been through enough. So God said, you pray for these these so-called comforters. And Job did. And you know what? They, they, uh, the community start bringing in gold and silver. And they started bringing in everything. To God's servant Job. And the book said he had twice as much as it ever had. Old lady Job was too old. She didn't have 20 kids. But God made her have 10 more. And she went 90 months pregnant. That's a long time to stay pregnant. She just had one kid right after another. God has to have a sense of humor. To write a book like Job, you know that? Those 42 chapters. It's an incredible thing. Look at it. But when God starts a work, brother, He's going to finish it. And just like the testings and trials that this church has gone through, I can assure you tonight, if the God I know from this book, one of these days He's going to vindicate Landmark Baptist Temple here on this hill, and He'll cause two-bit politicians to shine our shoes. You write that down. And remember I said it. We need to get a better understanding of who God really is. And we better stay in touch with this wonderful Lord. 
that can help us so very much. And I, I would like to call your attention especially. Which one is it? Verse 17. And uh, I believe that's in the, uh, in the sixth chapter. And he said unto him, If now I find grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. I want to talk about looking within yourself. Have you ever really done that? Show me a sign that you are talking with me. Verse 17 of chapter 6 of Judges. Show me a sign that you, that thou talkest with me. Don't criticize Gideon for this. He wants to know for sure. I don't think it angers God at all. I think he likes that. I don't think Job was, uh, uh, judge, uh, rather, Gideon's out of place here in Judges. He said, just show me a sign that you talketh with me. If God was dissatisfied with him, he'd have rebuked him. Now you can read how that he went in, he got, a, he got all kinds of signs. He got all kinds of things. And over in chapter 17, in verse 10, he says, If you were afraid to go down there to, with Furoi thy servant down to the host, he said, uh, he said, If thou fear to go down, then go with your servant, and I'll give you another sign. And you know what he did? And he had to go down there, and those, uh, uh, those men were talking, where the Midianites and the Malachites, uh, they were like grasshoppers for multitude. And when he was come, he heard a fellow say, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley, bread, tumbled unto the host of Midian, and came unto the tent, and smote it that it fell, and overturned it, that the tent lay alone. And his fellow, his friend answered and said, This is nothing save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand hath God delivered, the, uh, delivered Midian and all the host. God just scared the daylights out of them. Wasn't a cannon fired. There wasn't a rumble of tanks. There wasn't an atomic bomb dropped. God just shook them up with a dream. Isn't that an amazing thing? And now Gideon's getting all of that laid on him. Don't you know that is a blessing to him? And I, I've said all that to say this now to help you. There's not a one of us here today, but what we too have had God to reassure us again and again. His reassurance. God not only assures us, but He reassures us. And day after day, God is building His people, if we'll let Him. And he is strengthening his people. God will not forsake us. God is in the business over and over again of helping his children. Doesn't that make sense? But in, in verse 21 of that seventh chapter, if you want to be a member of a winning team, you're going to have to stand every man in his place right about the camp. There's a place for everybody. And now I'm get, getting into the nuts and bolts of what I'm trying to get over to you to be a member of a winning team is find the place where you belong. Now, I don't ride this horse. Some of you come and say, well, now there's a little church out there. It's about 20 miles from Landmark, and, and I think I'll move my membership. You don't, y'all won't miss me at Landmark. If there's any, I'd rather people would spit on me than to say that to me. First of all, it shows stupidity. I, I said to a person not long ago, I'm embarrassed that I'm pastor of anyone as stupid as you are. I think I got through to that person. Now come on, I'm not saying that God doesn't lead people. But these dumb statements that his sheep make to justify backsliding and indifference and a thousand and one other things to keep from finding your place, brother, that will not, that will not go with God. 
I ought to know. I'm an expert at this. My wife was looking at a map yesterday flying across the Tetons and showing all of these scores and scores of cities where this airline has connections. And uh, she handed it to me, and I looked at it for a while, and I got curious, and I went through it, and I found, I said to her, I preached in every one of those cities in the United States and Canada except two. What I'm saying is this, that I feel I have let God lead me, whether it is Toronto, Ontario, Canada, or Jacksonville, Florida, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Memphis, Tennessee, Detroit, Michigan. Lord, here I am. I'm available. Let me know where you want me. Let me know when you want me. Let me know. And the preachers who are here today will bear witness to this. We leave it in God's hands. And beloved, that's the way it is with every one of us. If you're going to be a member of the team, if you are, then you've got to be willing to say, here my Lord, take me and make me what I ought to be and put me where I'm supposed to be. Let's stand with our heads bowed.